You all come back to our front. My name is Raymond Dark. Now, according to the 2023 budget, Ghana coughs out over $10 billion every year to meet our import bill. It is trite learning that the demand for foreign exchange to support our unbridled demand for imports undermines and weakens the value of the city. This contributed to the depreciation of the city, which, according to the Minister of Finance, has seen some 53.8% of its uh, depreciation of its value since the beginning of the year. This level of depreciation is driving the cost of goods and services high for everyone. That's why it's, it's part of the reasons why inflation is 40.4 anyway. It's why today we are seeking to understand exactly what government is going to do about this problem once and for all. As is being stated in the budget, the government is going to boost local productive capacity and among others, cut imports by some huge margin. My guest is a man who previously used to be in charge of the Ministry of Trade and Industry. I remember for a very long time, he used to fight interest rates, form committees, insist that he doesn't understand why they are so high and they need to make businesses deliver. He was perhaps more popular for the sugar factory, the Commander Sugar Factory Conversations. Dr. Ekospiga, welcome to our front. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you are doing well. By God's grace. By so God's grace. we hardly hear from you. Where have you been? Uh, I've been around, uh, mostly in Ghana, but I have had some international assignments also from time to time. So I do also serve the international community mm. in a variety of ways. You, you, you don't appear to be in a campaigning mode. You are not running for president. <laughs> no one is running for president, as far as I know, <laughs> yet. <laughs> not, in, not in NDC, but, not in NPU. But, but people approach. Eventually, oh, they, will, they, always, well, they always approach yeah. anyone they feel can serve the national interest. And certainly because I have demonstrated an interest in yeah. serving the national interest and, as it were, you know, downsizing my own personal interest. There will be those that will always come and say, are you not running? Are you running? Are you not running? That happens yeah. all the time. So have you taken a decision? Oh, not at all. Two have already all. announced intentions. To well, it's okay. I mean, I think in, the, in any race, yeah. whether it's, a, it's in the World Cup or uh, a normal athletic race, there will be those that will be early birds and early runners, others that will be late runners. But in my judgment, our party has not yet announced um, invitations for anyone who is interested in running for that particular position. The positions that are currently okay. on offer, as you know, are those of national executives, chairman, general secretary, national organizer, deputies, and all that. And there are candidates that have come forward, but I'm sure when the party announces invitations for okay. those who want to run, those who are interested will obviously express their interest. At Do you that think time. there's a presumptive candidate? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, we have had a president mm -hmm. in our party, a living president, and therefore a past president, okay. President Mahama, who obviously enjoys a high level of popularity within the country. And so when NPP fails and people look forward to an alternative, he's one of okay. those that people will obviously look forward to expect. And he has shown interest in being a candidate in the past. So if you say it's presumptive, then yeah. it is reasonable to expect it's that interesting. he may continue to show interest. Now, let me shift you. But his, his language, though, is that he will support whoever the party chooses. chooses <laughs> for, I'm sure he will go here. It's interesting. Well, yeah. you know, that's his official language, yes. Well, now, let me start with this uh, issue because it's, it's important. It's almost like, and I was reading Kellex, who was tracking way back from Nkrumah's time, okay. our plans. So when Nkrumah was leaving office, we had like 350 or so of the state Industries, yes. Yes, industries. Correct. The presumption is that Ghana cannot import its way into prosperity. That's true. And that's right from the beginning Correct. determined. Correct, yes. And that's the way the global economy works. Unless you or someone can tell us a country that is highly import dependent and not a natural resource producer which has you know worked this way into prosperity the, the presumption is that you must produce goods and services and also it's also well known that the more value you've added to any particular good or service the higher the value so your interest from an economic point of view is to sell 
your products at the highest level possible. And if you don't add value to it, then you're only getting a small percentage of the potential revenue that you could get from that same product. So 65 years, why haven't we done this? Well, it's partly due to the flip-flopping of governments, but also, in my judgment, the lack of willingness to undertake a national long-term program or campaign to change the mindset. You see, everything be begins in the mind, everything, almost everything anyway. So as long as people go around and do not seem to be aware that if I buy this product and it's an important product, I'm actually punishing myself okay. and my family, my children, my daughter, and my son who wants to go to this school or that school and making it difficult for the whole government, which represents our interest, our collective interest, to provide revenue for all of us to have a better life, then we'll have that problem. So it's a mindset change. Mm. And when it comes to mindset changes, you can have doctors trying to change minds, you can have pastors and church leaders, university professors changing minds, but the profession, which globally is understood to be mind changes, mind changes, is the communication profession. Mm. And that's why I, as Minister of Children Industry, appointed by President John Mahama, set about very quickly to create a Made in Ghana committee. Okay. And to, put a, to, to begin the process of launching a Made in Ghana campaign. So we produce a logo to be the symbol that all Ghanaians, if you go to any shop to buy any product, will look out for That's to symbolize the fact that this is made in Ghana. Therefore, prefer it and buy it to the preference of other communities that are also lined up in the same shop. The Made in Ghana committee did a good job. That logo came out. We wrote to a number of companies to see those who could support us. A few responded. Many more would have responded if we had a full launch of the Made in Ghana campaign, which we didn't get a chance to, to do. But when the new government came, the current government, MPP government, somehow they abandoned the Ghana, Made in Ghana campaign. They um, dismissed or terminated the people who were in the Made in Ghana campaign secretariat. And so the brand Ghana office, as it was called then. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a, a national branding program, to the best of my knowledge. And I, I wonder why the NPP will, I mean, terminate a, a group of people who are mostly professionals from the Chartered Institute of Marketing Ghana, Institute of Public Relations, Advertising Association of Ghana, and such technocrats, you know, working their profession. It was not political appointees at all. And they have not replaced them with any other group that I'm aware of who understand branding, who understand marketing, who understand selling and salesmanship, who understand communication, and who can change the minds of majority of Ghanaians so that they become buyers and um, you know, promoters of Ghanaian products. Now, you may remember that when it comes to changing the minds of Ghanaians, that's probably why I entered Ghana in the first place, because I was working overseas when our president, then Jerry John Rawlings, mm -hmm. decided that he needed somebody who, according to him, had the kind of experience that I had working internationally and who could bring some of that experience back to Ghana. So among the tests, the first test he put to me as Minister for Communication was Chief, as he used to call me, you know, we're trying to bring this value added tax, VAT, in 1995. Yeah. And then due to the demonstrations, Kumi Prekong, yeah. which, as you may know, or as for the, for the younger ones who don't know, were organized and instigated by the current president who and his party who were against the imp, 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 introduction, introduction of the value added tax. And so President Rollins had to suspend the VAT completely in 1995. Uh, my dear departed colleague and senior friend, Kwesi, Dr. Kwesi Boche, was then the Minister for Finance. So there was a decision to suspend that whole VAT, just as the e-levy the e seems to cause a problem because it has also not been well understood, well marketed, etc. So, cut quick back to 1995, 1997, when I became Minister, he said, look, do something about this VAT that the people of Ghana did not want. They say you're a, a, you're a communication professional, an expert, to do something about it. So we set up an 
um, month campaign in 1997 to 1998 with President Mama, who was then with me in the Ministry of Communication, and several communication professionals. And we went at it, the issue of V80, breaking it down into its component pieces, mm -hmm. identifying the stumbling blocks and the various stakeholder groups that either did not understand it well or were likely to oppose it, and did a whole lot of things that we can't get into tonight to convince Ghanaians that VAT, VAT, is actually important. Actually, it's very good. And if you can accept VAT, it will change our economy. And indeed, for the business people who are very you know, um, uncertain and worried about it, we are able to show them that if you subscribe to VAT, you become a VAT eligible business, you can take government's money for 30 to 45 days, mm. almost like an interest-free loan for your business and pay the government 30 or 45 days later, which was a wow, a revelation to business people who flocked towards the VAT. And that got us to where we are now, where the VAT has helped this economy through the Ghana Education Trust Fund, through the National Health Insurance Scheme. And now even this government wants to increase the VAT itself past 20%. So if it was so bad, according to the incumbent government, which was then MPP, and we did was opposed to it, how come VAT has done so well that that same party now is in government and is increasing the VAT? It is in the same vein, just to answer part of your question, that the, a group of professionals still exist in Ghana who, given the opportunity, can convince Ghanaians about the merit of subduing their preference for non-made in Ghana products, preferring Ghana-made products, and raising our production and our revenues in that field until we have a surplus in our balance of payments and balance of trade, and which is the, the solution at the economics level for most of our problems. I will come to this. <laughs> you mentioned Brand Ghana. Yes, please. There is a 25th of uh, June story mm. dating back to 2018, okay. which says the Brand Ghana office has been replaced mm -hmm. with a committee <laughs> which okay. is taxed to market the country to the rest of the world. Fantastic. This according to the acting chief executive of the Ghana Tourism Authority. Akrisi Ajiman is his name. Can you yeah. mention the names of the members of that committee? The new committee. Well, the committee from... Fairness, it just mentions um, one Helen Annan as the chief executive for the office. In fact, that the, the office was... The previous one, yes. Yeah, yes, that's mm -hmm. 2009 uh, by the late President John Mills. It doesn't give details of who the new members were. In fact, but it I'm, only says that currently the brand office does not exist. <laughs> what we have done is to form a committee of minds. Mm. GIPC is one of the main agencies that promote Ghana okay. when it comes to investment. Correct. So we do marketing and promotion of Ghana as a destination. And then we have free zones and the Ghana is part of promotion authority. So we formed a small working group to look at brand Ghana. How do we sell it? We want to find a common ground where all these things can sink. You're, you're speaking to my colleague on, uh, so on the sidelines. I'm, I'm more I'm asking working. for your general knowledge of being a very experienced and highly informed journalist or media personality, whether you yourself, through any means, know of a certain Ghana, made in Ghana, Ghana brand, something, whatever name they call it, mm -hmm. that is working aggressively to change anybody's minds about the issues you are raising. I can't recall any. There's ready. nothing like that. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, yes, no, there's nothing like that. Will, yeah. So the public officials who may be listening to us can send a message to you and you can announce which group or committee is doing the same thing and where they are located that nobody knows and what kind of programs they brought about recently that we are all not aware of. Because we all live in this country and we have a general knowledge of most things that are taking place. So I'm just saying that it's typical of the incumbent government, going back to Kwame Nkrumah's days, they will kill Kwame Nkrumah's ideas, try and kill the man himself if possible, try and destroy almost all the institutions that he established, Ghana's Farmers Council, Trade Union Congress, Conversion People's Party, all those things, and often not replace it with anything tangible. So it's like destruction for the sake of destruction. The last point I want to make on this is the, just a couple of years ago, November 5, 2020, the chairman uh, and world president 
of the International Advertising Agency Association. Zanetti. Uh, yeah, Joe Zanetti. Zanetti, sure. He called for the establishment of the Brand Ghana Office by Very an good. act of parliament. Excellent. To ensure that it receives dedicated funding. Very good. And he says the first Brand Ghana Office was established under President John Atamels. Okay. And moving forward, we should have actually kept it in place. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically... Same thing you're saying. Yes, uh, that in some... Governments, ma governments must learn that when they come into power, not everything a previous government has done should necessarily be replaced or abolished just because you want a job for the boys, you want your own people to be appointed, you want to engage in some contracts and procurement, funny, funny things. I mean, those are the things that are killing this country. Otherwise, the human beings in Ghana are one of the best human beings anywhere in the world. The United States, as you know very well, does an annual review of the, human its resources. own human resource yeah. capabilities and human resource needs and the gaps in the capacity. And Ghana keeps being ranked as, among Ghanaians in the United States, get ranked as among the best workers and most productive people of all other countries, compared to other countries, Ethiopians, Nigerians, South Africans, Indonesians, Bolivians, so why is it that when we come into this country, just based on, a, I'm sorry to say, a lot of pettiness, we are not willing to let the left hand know what the right hand is doing and let us work together. It's not honestly, partisanship. It's not partisanship. No, partisanship is there, but there's a role for the national interest. The national interest supersede should that. supersede partisanship. Let me give you an example. As Minister of Education, there was an incident in the Cabinet and our President Rawlings when I spoke in favor of the national interest by asking the government to appoint a transaction advisor to help the government in the then Ashanti Goldfields crisis. Okay. Who, were the, who were the Ghanaians that were appointed? Ken Oforiata, who was a well-known non-NDC person, but who had some skill sets that in data bank that could be used. So he was appointed along with another you know, prominent Ghanaian banker to be advisors to the NDC government under President Rawlings and Professor Mills, with the entire cabinet present. So there's a, a role for partisanship, when you just have to be partisan for the sake of being different. And there's also a time when we must bind together. That's why under NDC again, you had the Sinti Accord, where we attempted to bring Ghanaians along with us in economic management, and even as ambassador to the United States, I was instructed by then President Mills, Professor Mills, then Vice President, to work with the USAID who had provided funds for 60 Ghanaians, including about 20 NPP, you know, parliamentarians and NPP leadership to go to North Carolina, okay. United States, for us to sit for one week to think about our country, Ghana, and to plan as one nation. So we wore T-shirts with one Ghana on them to demonstrate our desire, even though it was partisanship, to forge a common purpose. When the results in parliament led to the 136, 137 thing yeah. early last year, I wrote articles in the newspapers in Ghana, Daily Graphic, where I was urging a national consensus over those things that we can together agree to promote. So there are things that divide us. Yeah, a few things can divide us at the regional level, at the ethnic level, at the religious level. But there must be some core principles that ought to unite us, which includes the Constitution, which proposes a National Development Planning Commission, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be a, not so much a, a, a non-partisan. And the government should be able to call on people like my late friend, Professor Kuzi Bochwe, who died, has died, but he died without, you know, after giving a lot of his support two governments that in the last six years was, was, was not alive, he was, was alive. Really. How come this government could not take advantage of his knowledge? And there are thousands of people, so don't let me personalize it. Okay. Former professors, former professionals, people who have won awards, Internet Hall, Hall of Fame, fiber optic cable inventors, National Aeronautics Space Administration, professionals in Ghana, in China, in Japan, wherever they are. Where is the football team of Ghana that will play the national football soccer team, not the World Cup type, but the Economic World Cup, 
okay. of Ghana. We bring everybody together. We have a team. We have a national team. We should have a national team. National Economic World Cup team. And play. And we'll beat other, all, almost all other, other countries, including especially most African countries. But we're not using the national potential <laughs> World I'm, Cup I'm happy team. you just mentioned the economic part, but I need to bring this on board. Currently, Ghana is in some serious economic situation. Very serious. We, we have a situation where the budget is proposing that we are going to an MF program. A certain measures, revenue in nature and expenditure, I suppose, we brought on board. In fact, the government is even indicating that we are not starting certain projects. We are going to cut back on them. Some to the point that we are reducing convoy and we are proposing to reduce convoy. We are going to do the importation of the usual things, calendars and all the other things. We are going to print them. Mm -hmm. The idea is that the current situation we have, we demand an IMF program. From where you sit, in fact, this country has been to the IMF 16, 17 times. From where you sit, what do you think about a country that consistently, every four or five years, will have to get an IMF program to survive? And the fact that it's being repeated now more than ever in the current situation we find ourselves in. Well, I mean, there are so many quotations about, you know, people who behave a certain way that history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, the underlying fact is that we are not choosing to learn the necessary lessons. Because all IMF programs are generally about is to make sure that you live within your means. Mm. Make it simple. Live within your means. Don't buy and spend money you don't have. Yes, you can borrow for a certain period, for certain projects, for certain programs. Make sure that the things you are borrowing for are things that generate income and revenue so that you can pay for them. Don't borrow and spend on frivolities on presidential travel and on, you know, all kinds of job for the boys. Travel, actually. Do you know that President Rawlings, and I'm telling you this because the youth have to learn the history of this country. When I joined the government of Ghana and when I went to the United States as an ambassador, it came, to, it came as an amazement because I was checking the records to find that President Rawlings, who was invited to the United Nations every year, like all other heads of state are invited, had never been to the United Nations in 12, 13 years. Is it because there was no presidential travel, I mean, budget, there was no presidential jet plane? That was not his priority. His priority was how to solve the problems of Ghana. And he knew that if he traveled overseas, it would cost money in seven, a delegation of 10, 15, 20 people. So let me stay in Ghana, clean the gutters in Nima, help to find cocoa, you know, as, as, as evacuation to the port and all these things that you've seen in videos and heard about as part of his life history. So there are choices that presidents make. A president can choose, President Rollins had also not even been to his own country, well, he was half British, for a state, um, a, a, a state official visit, but a state visit, for a state visit. He had been to the United States, he came down periodically, but not for a state visit. He had never been to the United States itself for any reason. Even though within three months of my being in the United States, I got an invitation for him to go to the United States. Okay. He couldn't believe it. Three months. In August 1995, he said, no, no, no. Hey, come on, come on. We, we spoke guys sometimes. <laughs> Tell them that I'm, you know, I visited Botswana. Give them an excuse. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready to come to the United States. It took us some months to actually get him to agree. America is always there. He can always go. But... That was not a priority. How can I solve the problems in Ghana? So, yes, we are talking about presidential travel. It's up to presidents to use the ambassadors if they want to do... To, and President Rawlings used D, President, Mr. D.F. Annan, yes, Annan, sometimes to address the United Nations. Mr. P.V. Obeng address the United Nations. Even the ambassador of your, the United Nations of your country can address the United Nations, if you so wish. African Union meetings, he did, he did go. He treated them. ECOWAS meetings, African Union meetings were his priorities. Commonwealth heads of state meetings, he barely attended. You know, so I'm saying these are choices that presidents can make. And then if you have to travel, of course you have to travel. You can travel in a commercial plane, which is what almost all ambassadors in Ghana and foreign ministers do everywhere. In fact, the UK High Commissioner, the UK in particular, and even the US embassy officials often have to go in economy class. They don't go even business class, much more first class, because their governments will not pay for those kinds of expenditures. Mm -hmm. We are talking about how to reduce expenditure in Ghana, sure. and I'm giving you these examples. 
that these are things that other countries that we borrow money from, we go to their various head, you know, capital cities and hold all kinds of dinners and borrow money from them. Then we come and they see us spending recklessly. And they don't understand that. You've been minister, and, and this matter that you're raising actually comes to fall. People are concerned about, currently, we are doing budget debate, but cabinet ministers, some members of parliament, are, are, some, if some are even watching football in Qatar, I will. and <laughs> some are complaining about the optics of that, of course. and how yeah. that plays into the space that we find. Even well. the president was not in the country during the budget reading. And all of the other conversations came up about, are we, too, are, we, are we that seriously communicating that we are serious about getting ourselves out of the current economic doldrum? With, with the current actions of the people who are supposed to be actively interested in what's happening to our Marshall Plan to get us out of this problem? Well, we don't have a Marshall Plan yet, but <laughs> we, ought to have, we ought to have one. Yeah. And to have one, you really need to have a national consensus. Yeah. You don't want your opposition parliament saying one thing and you, the so-called yeah. majority, mm -hmm. saying another, another thing. thing yeah. I don't know, at the end of the day, our children go to the same schools, our wives shop in the same markets, we all drive on the same roads, we all drink the water from Ghana water, use Ghana electricity. So yeah. there are some common things that yeah. could yeah. and ought to unite us. Yeah. But you have mentioned people, parliamentarians, presidents, ministers, also behaving as if there's no change. And for many parliamentarians, the critical change that they claim they see which will, will trigger a change in mindset for many is the finance minister being asked quietly, politely, respectfully to depart. After all, the, his deputy has departed, even though some say they've seen him in some photographs somewhere, which means he has not de departed properly. But officially, he's not in office. Yeah. So if the minister, deputy minister of state at the Ministry of Finance can leave office without the economy collapsing, you can be sure that, and if the minister, the ex-chancellor of the Exchequer, as they call him in yeah, the yeah, UK, yeah. who is the minister for finance, could resign overnight, one day, yeah. without the UK. In fact, the economy, I think, did a little better yeah. with the news of his departure. And I'm sure when the news actually comes that my good friend, Ken Furata, has finally accepted and agreed to leave office, you see an improvement in Ghana's bond indexes and other indicators of potential good health. Because there has been an unfortunate situation when, you see, when you, when you appoint people who have spent most of their lives making money for themselves and for their clients, and when they come to work as public servants, the only habits they've ever developed over 20, 30 years is to make money for themselves and for their clients. Mm. So it becomes very difficult to change that person's mindset. So if you find those who... Even when you consume, you presume that Ghana is the client. No, when you presume that Ghana is the client, but you have put the person in, then in a conflict of, in, of interest situation, where because he is signing documents for he, the government and also for himself, it becomes a problem. Okay. But if you look back into Ghana's history, we have had people like um, Mr. Kusia Mwakwata, once time Minister for Finance. We've had... Professor Abe, um, either PNDC secretary or so for finance, we've had Kwesi Boche. These people are people who are not businessmen. They're not trying to make money. You can, obviously nobody has anything against everybody living comfortably. So I'm not speaking against business people. I am also a businessman in my own small, small ways. But somebody whose interest in the job of Ministry of Finance, where he's conflicted through many um, historical activities and ongoing activities, you'll find that the, when Bawi Redu was Minister of Finance, he didn't have any allegations of any kind. Mm. Um, there have been several ministers of finance who, so Tekpa, who was you know, a tax expert working at the IMF, coming to work for the Ministry of Finance. So you don't have those kinds of situations. So when you have Idu Bahin and Kenufuriata, with very, very specific, large business interests, also overseeing the economy in a way where bond issuances can benefit them or their friends. That's not the kind of thing that a good president should be tolerating. Mm -hmm. And I think the president, if he's not aware, has been, his attention has been drawn numerous times by his own majority in parliament saying, thank you so much, 
we are losing ground. MPP themselves, they are worried about their, their, their popularity in Ghana, which they should be, because the election is coming up soon. And NDC is likely, obviously, to use a fact which is known to almost all Ghanaians, because all of us go to the market. We know what prices are happening, what, what is happening to prices of goods and services. So obviously, the opposition parties will use all these misbehaviors that MVP has been demonstrating against them now and all the way through the elections and well into the future. Mm. The, 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 the point I was raising with you was more connected to what do you think of the conduct of MPs and ministers who are, who are actually watching football instead of pushing budget which is being read and being debated currently? I, I, I wouldn't say have a, a roster of the number of MPs who are yes, in yes, it. Yes, you yes, may yes. have that. In fact, so, but so I'm saying if you're talking, if you're talking about 30, the, yeah. yeah, I, I heard, I read that even the minority, majority leader was complaining or yeah. some spokesmen were complaining about the House not having the right numbers. Yeah. And NDC was able to demonstrate that about 100 of their, our members have been coming into the chamber, but MPP have only 13 or 30 different, at different stages. Yes, so, yeah. and it's the, their budget. I mean, at least they are presenting the budget, so they should be there to defend it. And then there are those arguing, that, oh, they are in the Parliament House, but they are in their offices, and when the time comes, they will be called yeah, down to... Yeah, but some of them watching football elsewhere. Well, so that tells you, and that tells Ghanaians, that the government you have in place now is simply not serious about protecting your interests. The President said, I shall protect the public purse. I shall protect the public purse. But, Mr. President, you're not protecting the public purse in your own personal choices and in the choices of many of the ministers. For example, the unwillingness of the president to cut down the size of the government. That's the major elephant, you know, to use... When it comes to expenditure. Uh, the elephant in the room, the big elephant in the room, is the size of the government, epitomized by the, the size of the so-called Office of Government Machinery, which is the office of the president. Okay, okay. Whereas President Mahama... Not and the ministers. No, no, no. Well, that also, that also. But you have over 80 now. But if you have, you have 125. The during the, you yeah. have 125 no, but ministers we've and deputies. Yeah, previously. We no, actually see yeah. operated with over, just over 80 ministers. I get you, but yeah. previously at 125. Correct. When we removed all of the ministries of monitoring, ministry, yes, we removed some of these ministries. And we became how many? Uh, we became, now we are around 89 no, no, or something no, like not that. In, not in Ghana. Oh, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, no, I'll, I'll play no, no problem. I'm not. No, I'll plead with you yeah. to print this out. The number of yeah. ministries currently approved in Ghana. And if I'm wrong, I'll learn something. I'm, okay. I'm very, very happy to learn. As far but as you I want know, that cut down. No, I'm saying that we are not, we have, we have not cut down any ministries that anybody knows. Okay. Mention three ministries, not departments or agencies that have been collapsed or cut down. Because I've heard people arguing, even this week, that oh, you can merge, you can merge, you can merge. No, for example, ministries. regional and reorganization. Yes. Regional creation and reorganization ministry was actually, uh, what do you call it, removed. Again, that particular ministry for monitoring and evaluation, which Dr. Akutu said yes. used to be in charge of, Correct. was also removed, actually. As a so, ministry. Yes, as a ministry. Yeah. So those and were, as a department within the office of the president, president yeah. we are told. So these were, these were just, I would say, artificial or atmospheric type changes, which do not go to the heart of the expenditure patterns. You see, because those particular ministries did not have even proper budgets that allowed them to okay. procure and spend and misbehave. Um, but the core ministries and others, like Minister of and President Mahama, a Minister of Transport handled aviation, railways, road transport, and everything. Minister of Transport, that's what you need. And most countries have just Ministry of Transport. The United States has 20 cabinet ministers, 20. And they can do all the job for this very large country, the world's richest country. So what's the idea China about also has just 20 um, ministers. I think NDC has, in various manifesto documents, we've also often talked about at least not more than 20 ministers and deputies. It because it's the deputies that often make the, the, increase the, the, number, increase the yeah. numbers. Generally, you need one deputy for most ministries. And then you have now 16 regional ministers yes. who can either work on their own or if they also end up having a deputy each, mm -hmm. that simply multiplies the number. But beyond the ministries, the budgets themselves and the expenditure patterns, if the, under, the government of Ghana under President Mahama only a few years ago could subsist on 
a budget of 300 million CDs, 400 million CDs. Most people are aghast as to how that budget quadruples under uh, another government. And it's because the job for the boys, where people who are party affiliated have been appointed, and you don't want them to go home because <laughs> removing or downsizing those behemoths, that's a big word, those huge uh, organizations involve, you know, downsizing. I mean, human beings have to, to go home. And the president is not willing to do that because these are people who he feels are needed to go and campaign in the next yeah, two years. That's interesting. So they are being kept around. And while they are there, even when you say their salary has been cut by 10, 20, 30 percent, oh, their salary has been cut. Okay, then that is why they can now find other interesting ways of adding to the cutbacks in salaries. I thought that was a good decision. Oh. The cutting back of salaries. Oh, yeah, but cutting back of salaries was practiced even under President Mahama. When we also went to the IMF, all ministers had salaries reduced and, you know, were contributing 10% to a certain fund which was being used for mostly hospital and chip compound work. So the idea of downsizing, reducing salaries and also consolidating ministries, that's the part that the MPP government does not seem to want to do. You don't need to have a ministry of aviation when Ghana has no airline. So when you say Ministry of Aviation, you have a civil aviation authority. You have a Ghana airport company. Why does a similar... Then you say Ghana Ministry of Railways. Yeah, we all, we all believe in railway development. But it doesn't have to be a, a, a sole ministry. How many negotiations can they conduct at a time? How many railway lines are we building? And then former Ministry of Transport under Jifa Tivo at one time, then Fifi Kwete another time, and Madame Mokhtari as a deputy, just two, okay. to do all the work of that ministry. So with due respect, when people say MPP has the men, they have the men, the men and the women, why do you need seven men to do what two NDC ministers used to do? You don't have the men and women. Now, I, I want to drill down to the crux of this conversation about government saying, and this is what I'm quoting from what the president said during his very important speech about the turnaround that we need in our economy. Gagisberg. Yes. Mm -hmm. He says, we will make Ghana more export and not import. In fact, exports and not import will be our mantra. That's what he said. Good idea. After all, we host the headquarters of the African Secretariat of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. Correct. Is it good? Well, by God's own grace, I had the privilege of being responsible for the construction of that wonderful edifice called the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, Ghana Export House. But the preparatory work was done by my illustrious predecessor, Hayuna Idrisu, and I saw to the construction of the building. And um, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat is inside it now. Ghana Exports Promotion Authority is in there. And a lot of very, you know, um, worthy tenants in the building. But the issue is how are we going to reduce our imports, our import bill? And I've just said to you that reducing the import bill and changing the so-called Gagisberg economy has to do more with the minds, changing the minds of Ghanaians to let them appreciate what happens to our economy when we become too import dependent. Because it's a human issue. We make choices every single day in everything we drink or buy or produce or eat and so forth. And if people don't understand why they should change their behavior when it comes to certain um, import substitution ideas, as the word is, they may not go along with it. So it, is, it just becomes a slogan which has no legs to stand on. You are going to buy a vehicle. Why should you buy a foreign vehicle when you can buy a made in Ghana vehicle? In, vehicles, by the way, are the one single largest export item in Ghana, you may know. We import sometimes about 400,000, 500,000 vehicles every single year. And that alone is simply a hit on a budget. And yet we have made in Ghana vehicles, like the one being made by Apostle Safo. Yeah. So I visited this factory. Even my ministry and I mean, we ordered one of the first 
vehicles that was Kantanka that was being made in Ghana just to demonstrate our interest in supporting made in Ghana goods. Irrespective of the fact that some people were whispering, oh, well, his daughter and himself, they are not for this party. They are Ghanaians. They are making goods and services. Certainly. So the government of the day, using government of Ghana money, which is not my money, not your money, mm -hmm. is all of us's money, can patronize that company. So it's good that under MPP, a number of assembly plants have been established. That's good. But, and so they produce made in Ghana products. And I think it's the legislation and the inducements that yes, are fine. needed to support those made in Ghana products. So we had a fairly elaborate made in Ghana agenda and a campaign that this government did not follow through where there would have been policy initiatives. For example, if you decide that all secondary schools must eat made in Ghana rice, okay. especially when you're using a, a, a free, free, free uh, SHS, SHS yeah. program, or all Ghanaian military, police, and other uniform services, mm -hmm. because they are uniform services, so they are also supposed to sacrifice for the nation when it comes to war and all that, must buy food that are made in Ghana, principally from rice, cooking oil, I mean, the, the core items. Mm -hmm. Sugarcane would have been on the list if the MPP have also followed through with the sugarcane factory, okay. which they keep arguing didn't exist. Mm. Or was it is sugar to come and continue <laughs> the uh, what they call production? Oh, no, I mean, yeah, imported sugar cane because oh, of the lapse shame. in production here. It's a shame, it's a shame, it's a shame. Then people should learn. We, we've all now seen the hollowness of almost all the arguments they're making about they have the men, the women, the men, the women, about the, you know, if the exchange rate, it should expose you and all these biomimic acclamations. They have been exposed for whatever they know. NDC may not have made as much noise. We probably didn't have as many slogans as we could have or we should have, but we manage the economy with the interest of Ghanaians at heart. The real history of Ghana, for the young people who are watching me, is that a certain group of Ghanaians come and help take into account the interest of this country. And we start with the Nkrumah government. The Nkrumah's government was very nationalistic in mindset. They have made mistakes. Some corruption took place. No question about that. But Nkrumah himself was so focused on this country that he left office without one square meter of land belonging to him or his family. I don't know how many young people know that because any time I see this, it's what they are surprised. Nkrumah had not a single house. He didn't leave any plot of land for any of his children. That's Kwame Nkrumah for you. So we learned this, and I was a young pioneer. We followed Nkrumah's messages very closely. Now... Come back to their rulings, because you had military governments, MPP came in, Buzia government, they did whatever they could. General Rollins came in, I've told you what he did. He was sacrificing yeah. for Ghana, exactly. he was not traveling, he was focusing on the work to be done. He appointed people here and there, his family was not appointed, he had relatives as well, like everybody else. No member of his family in government for 19, 18 years. That's General Rollins. He died recently, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and his daughter... It's obviously in Parliament based on her, her, on her own merits. Mm. But Mahama, President Mahama, Mills first, and Mahama also came. Mahama was a very, I mean Mills in particular, was a very um, austere person. He lived in the same house in Reggie Manuel, like most other Ghanaians, three-bedroom, four-bedroom house. Even after he was out of office as a vice president, okay. he went back there. While he was a vice president, his wife worked like anybody else. It was not time to be first lady, second lady, going around with all these cosmetics. The point you're making is... And I'm saying that we can live frugal lives. Okay. And, and, and unfortunately, IMF conditionality will compel us to be frugal. Okay. Because we'll be measured by a number of benchmarks, mm. which are the point of negotiations between our team and the IMF team. It's not so much about you can't do this, you can't do that. You bring a program yourself where we shall see your books balanced. Many people have pointed out to even the current budget where there are so many unusual, you know, um, budgetary provisions, even for, I, I think the National Cathedral is still there somewhere. Yes, now officially made provisions for. What, what does that mean? Is the, it was the government, the president serious when he said, I will protect the public purse. In any case, the National Cathedral in particular is a commitment I've made to God myself, a personal commitment, 
and I'll see to the building of a cathedral in honor of God, which is great. I've been the chief executive officer of a church, a well-known church. Mm. I've also been the chief of staff of a well-known church. So I have nothing against churches. In fact, we clap when churches are built. But I'm saying that you don't need the government of Ghana to build a church. When <laughs> private citizens have built Olympic-sized churches around the Tetequashi, or what do you call it? Um, I get you. Tetequashi, and about. My good friend from Volga, big church. My, my younger brother, Daga Williams, a big church. Many churches in Ghana, built by ordinary Ghanaians, with tithes and offerings that are available. Why impose a church that you claim you, are, you have an arrangement with your God or with God about on Ghanaian citizens? It's not part of the budget. It shouldn't be there. The last question I want to ask you connected to this is, we have already started by restricting the amount of forex we support imports with, especially for the ones that the president mentioned, be it from rice, poultry, vegetable oil, two pigs, fruit juice. Is that a step in the right direction? I haven't seen the... I've heard parts of the budget program. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the policy um, document that supports and drives that particular agenda and the ways in which the procurements will be done in such a way that we don't procure. But I've given you some suggestions as to how procurements can be varied in such a way that it's not likely that government funds, private citizens can probably continue to buy whatever they want to buy until we change their minds, as I've suggested. But the government funds can be so sequestered or so set aside that it doesn't go towards procuring any of these goods that are on this or any other okay. cons constri constricted list. So we restrain ourselves from buying things that we don't have to buy, especially using public funds. So it's a good step in the right direction, even though I don't know the underpinnings of the policy, so I can't speak adequately to it. One district, one factory. Is it your results? The one district, one factory was just a mirage in the sense that individual projects that individual business people have proposed and promoted Contrary to what we were told in 2000 or 19, in 2016, when the MPP were coming to power, we thought one decision, one factory would be projects that were created, funded, and partly at least managed by public institutions. In midstream, they realized that it probably wasn't going to work that way. So they went to inviting individual companies that have their own projects come and let us wrap around the one district, one factory flag around your personal project and we give you some particular incentives for allowing us to do so. That's what one district, one factory is. To the extent that it will help industrialization, or it will help somebody who would not have gotten a loan even though we established Ghana Export Import Bank, mm -hmm. not MPP. So to the extent that people who could not get loans may be able to get loans at a more affordable rates, lower interest rates, and also to facilitate the exports that will come out of their factories, partly used in the Ghana export, um, the free zones, which has also was established by NDC and the Rawlings, and which is still a viable institution, then those things are, are fine. But the, if you look at the factories that have been established, which apparently are over 100 of them, yeah. and you go to the history and see who had the idea, how it came from, you find that probably 75% were existing companies which have simply been rebranded and remolded and put under the umbrella of the one district, one factory and given some certain incentives. So it's not bad, but I'm just saying that it is mischievous in terms of misleading the public as to what the, the government wanted to do. Within the next two years, can we drive down interest rates? Because you fought it for a very difficult. long time. It's structurally difficult. I've, I've argued that of all the things that we import, <laughs> it is, we import so many things that we've talked about. Yes. We import, actually, we import about 150 different items. food items. Mm -hmm. um, we we, we export, export about 150 and we import 170 um, food items. But 
of all the things that we have worked on, what surprises me is that we are not able to import low interest rates. You know that Europe, there was a time <laughs> yes, when of course. European countries we had even negative interest rates where the bank was paying you, the customer, to come and borrow from the bank, especially in the Nordic uh, countries. Uh, the central bank keeps increasing the MPC, well, uh, what they call it, prime rate. <laughs> I'm not an economist, but my friends, I'm with the best economists in the world at both the African Development Bank okay. and in, at the World Bank. So most of them will advise that you, because you are a developing country, sometimes you don't have to use the textbooks that you read in yeah. Europe and apply the principles there in a very automatic manner. When your the economy, the structure of your economy is very different, the mindset of people are different, the reaction to your policies may be different, and therefore you... I would have suggested a situation where we drive down the policy rates, we drive, we drive down the, the interest rates, but of course, government may have to pick up some of the tab as it has. But if you imagine those who claim that we spent $25 billion or some figure like that, or cities rather, to collapse at least nine banks, we collapse them. Those 29 or 21 billion cities could easily have been subsidies for interest rates, if you wanted, as a policy. So these are policy choices. We've collapsed banks who were lending to Ghanaians, especially the locally owned banks, mm -hmm. like the bank owned by Mr. Indom, by Mr. Dufour, and by Beige Capital and all that. And we have left the foreign owned banks to dominate our economy. So our economy is dominated in the gold sector, where the government actually says they want to do oil for gold trade. But how much gold do you produce? You don't produce even more than 2% of the gold through the you know, micro and small scale mining companies. So the most of the gold produced in Ghana are produced by multinational companies. As Minister of Mines and Energy for a short period, I had dinner with Australian miners and I told them, look, the government of Ghana allows you to keep 70% of your gold proceeds, okay. how much of it actually do you need? So if you get 30%, that would be okay. So if you talk to the operators, they'll tell you. If you tell them to design for themselves a new gold mining, gold mineral development program, they'll do, they'll, they'll do that for you. We should continue this discussion in the future, <laughs> but my time is up. They actually, so sorry. Wow. Yes, yes, we sure should be doing this consistently, but thank you so much for joining today's Upfront. Many thanks to you for watching.